To begin, I just want to say I'm uh, a really big thank you to everyone on this stage today. And I'd really like to extend thanks to you all for staying through a long day. Thank you. I hope that you found the experience a moving one. I myself flew every session, the morning, the midday, and the afternoon was really touched by so much history that we have presented to us through poetry, through song, through critical discussion, reflection, performance. And I think this is the true way that we should be learning the journey beyond the arrow and leaving the echo chamber. Well, what we did was we asked uh, people to um, write questions on question cards, and we got a couple, so that's good. So maybe we can start from there, right? And then if, uh, as we're doing that, if any of you have some questions, of course, we'll take them from the floor. So, uh, Zoe, do you want to start? Mm. So, someone from the audience has a question for Kidlut. Kidlut takes a conciliatory, almost generous tone with regard to the dominant hegemonic system. For example, he says he likes Marilyn, that he would watch a Hollywood blockbuster, which contrasts with the polemics of Imani Brown. Should we move beyond cultural confrontation? Is this the indie genius or its fatal flaw? I'm not quite sure that I even understand the question. <laughs> is this audience member in the is this member of the audience here? Okay. Perhaps we should get you to elaborate your question a little bit. Uh, no, it, was, it was very simple. I, the, the question uh, is, the tone that you took, Kidlat, was not to suggest there's anything better. You took a kind of relativist position with the kind of approach that you have, as opposed to um, the idea that because when we speak of hegemonic systems, we need to somehow resist them, fight them, so on and so forth. So that would be confrontational. Your attitude doesn't seem to be confrontational. M my question is, you know, it, can we take a conciliatory attitude towards uh, the dominant systems of representation or, you know, or such? Does that make any more sense? I said that way? Um. Whenever people ask, oh, okay, my <coughs> when my mother saw my film Perfume Nightmare, uh, her first reaction is, why is, she, why is your film so anti-American? <laughs> and I had to find ways to explain to my mother how I'm not really hating the colonizers for whatever reason they have. So I'm not confrontational, I think, in the sense that many other angry films might be. Uh, I, I told my mother, I'm, I'm just talking about how we are, our culture has been repressed and maybe we can bring it back and let it be able to look eye to eye with our colonizers and not feel this burden of uh, as one of our writers said, we Filipinos have lived 300 years in the convent and 50 years in Hollywood. Um, this kind of thing has preoccupied me and I refuse to make a clenched fist film, you know, or a, <laughs> or a karate uh, punch film. I, I, if people say there's humor or I use uh, the softness of family, and even when we were fighting the dictator, I, I used uh, just funny ways to tell my children that 
we're trying to get a, a certain sense of breathing space. Uh, that's easier than probably using a cliche, go home Yankee, or uh, let's cut off their throats, whoever the enemy is. So this is just my approach. I, if that is, I hope that's answering your question. Um, Kidlat, what, what I found very interesting is, um, I mean, Sharad, you use the terms confrontation and conciliatory, this kind of opposition. But Kidlat, you were sort of saying, you know, you were not, you were less interested in confronting, but creating a certain kind of a context or condition where people could look face to face. So, you know, that's certainly not conciliatory in the sense of like appeasing and just, you know, but it, it, it was a, it's a very radical um, request, you know, that we can look at each other, uh, you know, the word equal doesn't quite apply because it's more complicated than that, but that ability to, to confront that way rather than to confront through uh, an antagonism or um, a reaction. Uh, that was a very profound kind of confrontation that you were speaking about, to be able to, s to see each other. I don't know if this has to do with Kapwa, which we talked about earlier, but uh, I, I, I sometimes get a feeling that when we get into hair splitting about who's the badder of the bad, baddest between you and me, who's the blacker of the blackest in terms of soul, and then I feel, where does that get us? I have uh, the other question. Um, it's, uh, it's for the artists about uh, suggestions for other practicing artists, uh, you know, uh, like points of inspiration. Uh, and what, I f what, what the question was asking was habits of practice and of being that you would recommend to other artists. Habits of practice and being. Maybe, maybe the word isn't so much recommend, right, to other artists, but as, as a practicing artist, what are some of the habits of your practice and habits of your being? The, the word habit, something that you do repeatedly, maybe it's not always so conscious, but in some ways has been helpful for you? A useful habit? Yeah, but, but, but uh, Kadim, you seem to be looking at me, so. Okay. Uh, well, I always love to sleep. Yeah, always, always love to sleep. But I can't sleep. I, I, I'm a very thin sleeper, sleeper. But I, like, mostly I sleep around like five hours, six hours, and uh, and it's a dream to sleep. Like I have this dream to sleep for entire day. Like when, and I always try to sleep. And then uh, they say. There's a phase between, you know, sleep and when you w wake up, there's a, I don't know, the consciousness in sleeping, uh, where I think a lot about my work, actually. And uh, I tell you one thing that I never told anyone, that what I, what my dream is always, to become a fast bowler cricketer only. <laughs> I never wanted to be an artist, I swear. <laughs> Just a fast bowler in cricketer that's it and I'll always dream about it and every time I sleep I dream about it that I'll become a fast ball cricketer and to be honest I'm a very clumsy person I can't even deliver one ball <laughs> but that's a dream yeah that, that's what I dream about and then um, I purposely not trying to draw anymore because uh, I found out that too much drawing was uh, uh, dragging me into uh, looking at the objects in, term, in, in terms of drawings and lines and too academic, it was too academic. So I, I kind of stopped drawing and uh, I think that's a, a habit. Yeah. yeah. I'm obsessed with language, languages. Um, but in terms of habits, and I think it's related, uh, I watch all the sci-fi that's on Netflix, on any TV, any airplane. It's constantly trying to think of something else. Shubigi, you were just talking about a, a language in sci-fi. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Funny you should mention, mention science fiction. Sci-fi 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm also a gamer. I spend almost all the time I get um, gaming. If I, I, I mean, I'd like to do eight-hour gaming stints. I have a fake online persona as a 17-year-old Korean boy because there's no way a 44-year-old Indian woman will ever be hired to do closed beta testing. So I was one of the people who tested Diablo, StarCraft II. These, this, is, this is what keeps me going. Um, the aggression and anger and rage and I suspect trauma that one accumulates when one deals with certain subjects that I think a fair number of us do. You need to work that aggression out somehow. And since I don't have a community like that, I am completely decommunitized. That's not a word. Please just don't look it up. Um, I, I found my community in anonymity online. And I don't know if this is helpful for young people, but don't be ashamed of your lousy habits. Your lousy habits will feed your guilt just enough um, for you to actually get your act together when you need to. Um, it's okay to be contradictory. It's okay to be a total screw up most of the time. Um, it's all right. It all feeds into, uh, and also very often comes from um, losses that you haven't yet articulated. Um, facts that, uh, in fact, I think a lot of us um, are always looking for context and um, I'm not one who believes greatly in identity, but are looking for it. I don't think there is singular identity or, or quantifiable identities, but we yearn, we do yearn, and my yearning took me to online gaming. Um, yours was to be um, a cricketer. It's a very, yeah, it's something I do understand as well. And I think we do have these aspects of us that very often don't get put front and center. Um, that's the reason also why I mentioned Snowden found his ethics in online gaming. It's not, co it's not contradictory to have these parts of your character, and they do come together if you're an artist, a practicing artist, or being, whatever that means. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, um, oh just picking up from Kadeem, that idea of dreaming. I love, I love um, actually nighttime is a really important time because it's when it's reasonably quiet. And... Uh, um, I suppose I just dream ideas, and I'm not very good at writing things down. I don't draw, I don't have a journal, uh, but what I find is the ideas that uh, remain with me are the ones that um, I'm most passionate about, uh, the ones that I can remember a couple of days later, they grow, and uh, that's one of the a generative space for me is um, the nighttime. And in terms of uh, Maori philosophy and, and darkness and, and the black is where everything comes from. So um, that's a really nice space for me. May I um, open to the floor uh, if there's some questions from, from the audience? I have more questions in Vietnam. <laughs> That's quite surprising. Does, any <laughs> Does anyone have any questions on the floor for each other up here? No? Yes? I have a question okay. for Zoe, mm -hmm. and also an acknowledgement, because um, mm -hmm. we are team Zoe. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm interested to hear from you what your, if you know yet how you're going to take what's happened over this past year and a half of thinking mm. and having seen the phenomenal output of the artists you're involved with and indeed the larger Biennale project. Um, how do you, do you have a sense of how it's shaping your, changing your thinking? Over the last near two years, because more than half of the exhibition were commissions, I would say the biggest thing that I take away is how much my own curatorial practice is not about exhibition making. 
that my own love of art is about how artists give physical aesthetic form to versions of fictions that often will never see the light of day. And I have developed a very big passion for that near invisibility. For example, I know, Tuan, you have an immense amount of data as a result of this project with Senegal, to which we heard perhaps only one fifth. Equally, I know with, with Kidla, there is still a mining of your films. Indeed, I think I've watched all of them at least five times each. And yet every single time I watch them, I learn something new. I think for me, what I really appreciate about the particular people that are inside this biennial, my small gesture of friendship, Indeed, I have to say most of these, most of all of you, I have known for quite some time, I'll be honest. That's not to say that there's some artists in my platform that I've known only relatively recently, but I have been watching their practices for a long time and the biennial gave me an opportunity to connect. You heard Anis Sosen speak earlier this morning, sadly he's not here now, but I've been an admirer of him ever since a dear friend of mine introduced me to him online. And the chance to have him here is immense. Mm. What I do with this next, I have to say, I think about my little community back home. Mm. I think about the Factory Contemporary Art Centre that I run with Twee Win, my founder. And I think, how can I bring this diversity to Vietnam? I think about how can this kind of conversation, could it ever occur in Vietnam? I'm compelled to try. It's Sha Zha Biennial. I think every one of us in this room understands that's pretty significant. There's going to be more opportunities for all of us, much higher up the so-called uh, Trojan idiot box, perhaps, <laughs> dare I say, Kid Lutz term. But I do think that every single one of us in this room, on, on stage, has a very particular commitment to locality. And if it's for that that I am deeply respectful and mindful of, what I do with this next, there's a lot more work to do. I think that all of us have uncovered pieces of history that we've become more committed to as a consequence of delivery. There is a need for delivery. There is a need for exhibition making to make us come to some kind of, dare I say, finality. But this is just process. We will keep going. I hope that there'll be much more writing. You have to look out for the catalogue as a consequence of all of these amazing artists who not only did what we did today, but they actually also wrote. So in the catalogue, you'll find a lot more additional nuance to the show, looking at the idea of water as a way of identifying movement of people and ideas. And I can see that's reflected also in numerous artworks across uh, the exhibition. I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Um, Leoli, did you? Do you want to say something? I was thinking, especially in this presentation, uh, just now, thank you to everybody, but um, about the tirailleur uh, Senegalais and Amber Chinois and um, the, what it, uh, personally in my case, like to, um, to not have access to my Persian ancestry through, um, organized persecution by the state in Iran across the water and uh, what it means to like spend time with my family in Samoa where I'm also from and 
to see these names in a, in a family tree where there's a huge emphasis on genealogy and it's always shifting whether you want that patch of land or you know, beef up your genealogy or whatever. Um, and there's these names and they're, and they're like Schmidt and Meredith and you know, European ancestors are really highly uh, valued in the race hierarchy in the islands. And then there's these two names where it's like came from China, came from China. And we only have their Samoan names. And it's like three gener uh, four generations ago, two sides. So, and then I was like, I asked my brothers, I was like, well, what do you think if I start saying that, I'm, that we're Chinese? But we don't really know where in Guangdong they came from. It's just like something that you can't really grasp. And it then somehow was so moved by the performances today, particularly thinking about what trickles down from a thousand years ago from Fredosi's text to, to this like tur turbulent, turbulent moment of now and in each place, but it's even creating this kind of experience that you've created, Tuan, is like a, like I, I often think about, can you replace absence or heal absence through presence, even if you're talking about the absence. I hope so. But yeah, it's more of a reflection, but thank you. Shall we? Yeah. yeah. Well, I really would like to thank uh, everyone who spoke today. Thank you to the Sharjah Art Foundation. Uh, yeah, actually, our, our, I have a... a you have a long list, so yeah. you want to go through that? Yeah, because... <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a massive list of people that I should be thanking, and I'm scared to start labelling individual people for fear I forget somebody. I'll say thank you to Khor and Reem of the Sharjah Art Foundation for their invitation in the first place. But I have to say a massive thank you to all of the staff of the Sharjah Art Foundation for making this possible. Um, and I also want to thank my team in Vietnam to the factory for tolerating my absence over the last two years so much. Uh, and then, yeah, again, a massive thank you to all of the artists, to you, Wang for your listening to me and my events and nervousness over the last two years. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, have a good evening.